Welcome back to One Piece Explained, episode 3 of the One Piece live action series by Netflix and Tomorrow Studios has a ton of really cool potential easter eggs and references. Things that just blew me away with the range of what they were willing to include or not to. Now, if you haven't watched my breakdowns for episode 1 and 2, I highly recommend it. There's always a bunch of details hidden in every episode, and if you're watching this and aren't subscribed, I'd appreciate it if you do. As always, I make these live action breakdowns with the intent of being engaging and interesting for longtime fans as well as brand new fans. As such, I will be doing my best to talk around some big story developments or reveals that are better experienced at your own pace with the source material, but I will be referencing things such as characters, story arcs, settings, etc. So, with all that said, let's get into the breakdown. The title of this episode is Tell No Tales, referring to Usopp's trade of habitual lying. It's also an abbreviation of the original phrase, Dead Men Tell No Tales, an age-old idiom that most recently probably has been associated with pirates in modern pop culture, largely thanks to 2017's Pirates of the Caribbean film that also used the phrase in its title though the origin of this phrase comes from olden times across several different cultures. Now this episode starts off with a flashback to seven years ago, and we're introduced to a young Usopp running through Serb village, falsely alerting its inhabitants of a pirate attack. On his head, you can spot the Jolly Roger of the Usopp pirates. In this source material, the Usopp pirates were a group of children from Serb village who pretended to be a pirate crew with Usopp as their captain. These characters and this plot point have not been adapted into this live action series, much to my personal disappointment because I think they add a lot to Usopp's character arc throughout this story, but hey, some things just don't make it in and that's fine. The outfit he wears here as a kid is pretty much spot on to his original childhood design from the source material. I also love the general look of Serap Village in this adaptation, with its close quarters buildings and homes, it has an almost labyrinthine feel to it that gives a lot more character to the village than what we saw in the source material with just a simple layout. Some of the villagers believe Usopp and begin to run for shelter, and among them is this one older man who seems to be an adaptation of Mayor Mornin from the source material, and we'll see more of him later on. But next to him on the wall, you can make out a few posters, and there are some crazy easter eggs here. The first poster reads, Actress tragically dies on stage, Victoria Sindri. Sindri is a character first introduced during the Thriller Bark arc, and was a famous and popular actress from the West Blue who died 10 years prior to the start of Luffy's journey. The depiction of her here is a reference to one of her stage portrayals as seen in the manga as well as the anime. I should note the discrepancy here though, since in the source material, Sindri died 10 years prior to the start of the series, while this episode starts off 7 years prior to the start of the series. Of course, this poster could have just been up here on this wall for three years. After all, Sindri was beloved by fans. Or, the live action is taking some liberties with these dates, as these posters are more meant to be easter eggs rather than explicit indicators of a timeline. But I will touch back on this in just a second. At the bottom of this poster is what looks to be some text that reads, World Government, with either their symbol or a globe beside it, and we'll dive deeper into this a bit later in the video as well. Over to the right of this poster is another one that is a bit harder to make out, and I'm not 100% sure on this, but it looks to me that it reads Gold Rogers with an apostrophe S at the end. Now, real quick sidebar, every time I say Gold Roger in these videos, there's always someone in the comments trying to correct it. Please, I've said it before, and unfortunately, I have to keep saying it. This is intentional. I've been trying so hard not to spoil big reveals for new fans, so thank you. Anyways, underneath is some text that looks to be in the shape of the word shipwright, and beneath that looks to be caught, and to me, this looks like it's executed. This poster may be a reference to Tom, a fisherman shipwright from Water 7 who built the Oro Jackson, the ship that Roger used to find the One Piece. Now, we saw a glimpse of this ship in Episode 1, as I talked about in my Episode 1 breakdown, and Tom was eventually caught by the world government for his hand in helping Roger's piracy, and long story short, he was put to death. In the source material, Tom was put to death eight years prior to the start of the series, and this takes place seven years prior. So if they're following that strict timeline, then this poster was up for about a year. If this is what I think it is, then this is a really neat Easter egg, as it works well thematically with the plot of the Straw Hat Pirates looking for their ship to sail the Grand Line in search of the One Piece, as we'll see later in this episode. We get a montage of Usopp doing this over the years until we get to him in present day, and he's stopped by the aforementioned Mayor Mornin. Above them reads a sign for Keel Street, and if you've read through the Water 7 arc, I'm sure you're very familiar with the significance of what a keel is. In short, it's one of, if not the most important part of a ship, and as we'll see, the streets in Syrup Village are named after various things related to ships, as in this adaptation, Syrup Village is the place known for its shipbuilding. 
Just a little bit later, we get another sign reading Ratline Steps, referring to the ladder-like rigging on a ship as seen here. This sign over here just reads Village Shop, but over to the right, you can read a sign for Meshi. This was the restaurant that the Straw Hats ate at in the source material when they visited Syrup Village. It reads Try Our Specials next to it, and there's a sign with the menu on it that's a little too hard to make out. The title card for this episode is themed after Usopp. We get his personal Jolly Roger as depicted by Oda, with the nose adjusted to be a little bit more realistic. Now the eye in piece is a nod to one of Usopp's various hammers he uses throughout the series. We cut to the Straw Hats and we get some outfit changes. Now Nami's new outfit here is a reference to her outfit in Chapter 28's color spread, while Luffy and Zoro's outfits look to be inspired by their appearance on the cover of Volume 11. However with Zoro, the one difference here is that the design on Zoro's shirt cuts off at the middle Middle, whereas the volume 11 design extends all the way to the bottom of the shirt. Nami opens up the map to the Grand Line, and this gorgeous map was illustrated for the series by artist Eric Rose, and there are a ton of little details here. We've covered most of these locations on the previous maps, but there's one new addition, and that's Frost Moon Island. There actually isn't an island with this name in the source material, though this could just be a reference to the island that Shimotsuki Village is located on, as Shimotsuki can be translated as Frost Moon, and that's what the early translation referred to Shimotsuki as. I should also note that this map does not actually line up with the map that we saw at the start of episode 1. Several locations are in different areas completely, such as Mirror Ball Island for example. However, this could be attributed to the notion that there isn't a complete map of the oceans just yet, as this is part of Nami's dream. So it's understandable that there exist conflicting maps just like how there were in olden times in our real world. Speaking of olden times, notice the two figures in the corners. Old nautical maps would often feature these illustrations of heavenly beings blowing wind in a given direction to inform the reader of the nature of the seas in that area, and this looks to be a nod to that. Down in the calm belt, we can make out several sea kings as I discussed in my episode 1 breakdown, and most of these designs look to be identical to the sea kings that we first saw in chapter 101. However, there is one that bears some resemblance to the giant snakes worshipped by the Shandians, such as Kashigami, as we saw during the Skypea arc. Over in the north blue, there is a squid or Kraken of some sorts. Now, this may just be unrelated to anything at all, but I should note, we've seen a royal squid found in the Grand Line, as well as the Kraken Surume, who came from the North Pole. Luffy unveils his proposed Jolly Roger, though in the source material, he does this after Usopp joins the crew, and then Usopp redraws it to the design that we know and love today. Across the source material, we see that Luffy is not the best artist, but he gives it his all, as evidenced by the specks of white paint on his face. The crew makes it to Syrup Village, and they scan the local bulletin board and find Buggy's wanted poster. After seeing his bounty, Zoro remarks that they should have stuffed his head in a bag and brought it with them, which should be pretty funny if you've already watched all 8 episodes. Now there is a ton of stuff on this bulletin board, mostly odd jobs and labor ads, but there are a few interesting tidbits. There's of course Alveda's wanted poster, but beside it is one for Don Krieg. In the source material, Krieg is an antagonist during the Baratier arc. Over to the right of Alveda's poster is a flyer for the Syrup Village AGM, which is likely referring to an annual general meeting. It looks like it lists a bunch of the topics of discussion and events, including a lost and found, and it looks like this is set to take place on April 15th. Now, I think this is the first explicit indication of a given date in this series. Now, in the source material, we learn that Luffy wished to set sail when he turned 17, so it's believed that he likely set sail on the day of his birthday, May 5th, which is Children's Day in Japan. If we apply this logic to the live action, then this flyer is likely at least a few weeks old. However, I'll touch a bit more on the date this episode is taking place throughout this video, as there's a bunch of references here. To the right, we have a poster with WENP at the top, and this stands for World Economic Newspaper, or the World Economic Journal as translated in the official Viz manga. This is a vastly popular in-universe newspaper that we see throughout the course of the series. The newspapers are delivered via News Coup, which we first saw in the source material after the Arlong Park arc, but in this live action, we saw it all the way back in episode 1. We also saw one at the very start of this episode. The poster itself reads War Continues on Broccoli Island. In the source material, Broccoli Island is located on the Grand Line, and has been in war for the last two years since present day. This would mean that the war on Broccoli Island started relatively recently in the live action series, and at the bottom, you have the world government tag as well. Now, next to this, we have a poster for Meshi, the aforementioned restaurant, and it reads 7 year birthday this Friday, which would mean that it actually opened up in the same year that we saw in the flashback at the start of the episode. Beneath it is a help wanted ad for dock work vacancies, but beside that is a poster for the Syrup Village Fete, which is a village festival celebration. 
All of these posters really help to make Syrup Village feel like a living, breathing town with all of its inhabitants, and this is some great set design. You can really feel the love they had for the series. We cut back to Orange Town to see Buggy has reassembled himself and is paid a visit by Kurobi, a ray fisherman who is part of Arlong's crew. I personally really like how the fishermen look in this series, the prosthetics and makeup just work for me, and when Buggy refuses to speak with Arlong, Kurobi hits him with a guffaw paw bomb. A fishman karate technique as seen in the source material where Kurobi performs an open palm strike to the chin. I thought using this technique in particular here was kind of clever as a guffaw is a very loud laugh and the technique's original name in Japanese also contains the word for joke, which all plays very well with Buggy's whole circus clown motif. Back in Syrup Village, Luffy feels drawn to the going merry and mistakes Usopp's voice for the ship being able to speak. This is a slight nod to the idea of the Club Outerman, a spirit that is the embodiment of a ship that has been cared for by its owners, based on real life German folklore. While a lot of Usopp's backstory with the Usopp pirates and his hopes of being a pirate himself have been cut from this adaptation, they have built in some nice characterization through him working in the shipyard and taking care of the ships to some extent. While the aspiring pirate angle isn't as strong, his connection to the Going Merry and ability to somewhat maintain it throughout the Straw House journeys works a lot better with this change. Over at Kai's mansion, there are a ton of little easter eggs in her garden. A lot of them look to be garden shrubs that have been shaped in the form of various animals from the island of rare animals that the Straw Hats visited right before arriving at Syrup Village in the source material. Over here, we have what looks to be the bear-tiger hybrid. And over on this side is what could be the panda bat hybrid that was exclusive to the anime. Though, some have seen this as a nod towards Panda Man, another one of Oda's recurring gag characters that can be found hidden in the backgrounds of various scenes throughout the manga and anime. This one may be a nod to the duck poodle hybrid, and over here is the lion pig hybrid, Lion Buta. We actually got a better look at this one in a promotional still that was shared online. And over on the steps, there's one that's a bit harder to make out, though the serpentine body makes me think of the rabbit snake hybrid. Kaya pleads with Clajador to let Usopp and the crew stay for dinner on account of it being her birthday, so this gives us an explicit date for when this episode is taking place, August 24th. Like I said earlier, I don't think we should necessarily be looking at Easter eggs as canonical indications of anything, especially when it comes to timelines. However, there are people like myself who enjoy piecing things together given what the show provides in conjunction with what we know from the source material, so let's just entertain this logic for a bit. Recall the idea that Luffy set sail on the day of his 17th birthday, May 5th. That would be almost four months between the start of his journey and this episode, which wouldn't make too much sense given the passage of time indicated in the, in the prior two episodes. But of course, you can pad some events out with implied travel time between islands, and you could also say Luffy had already been out on his journey for a little while at the start of episode 1, since we didn't see him depart Windmill Village like he did in the source material, etc, stuff like that. Maybe after these episode breakdowns, I'll do a deep dive into the timeline of the live action series, but for now, I don't think we should necessarily read too much into these dates, especially since in the source material, Kaya was 17 upon introduction, but in this series, she's set to be 18. Plahador allows the crew to stay for dinner, but instructs them to bathe and change beforehand. Usopp does a pit check, and Nami remarks that a bath does sound nice. Funny enough, we actually know the Straw Hat's canonical bathing schedules as told to us in Volume 67's SBS, so all of this does seem in character. Over in Kaya's room, you can make out a portrait of what looks to be Mary, Kaya's butler. Kaya also seems to be quite the skilled artist in this adaptation as you can find several sketches and various artwork all over her room as we see throughout this episode. We get a quick glimpse of the book that Kaya is reading from and there's not too much to go off of here. At first I wondered if this was a nod to one of the various in-universe pieces of literature that you can find throughout the source material, but I couldn't really line it up with anything. So then I wondered if this is a real life book that they used as a prop. I asked a couple friends who are a bit more versed in novels and books, and the best thing we could come up with was that this may be a specific translation of Hans Christian Andersen's 42 stories, with this specifically being from The Little Mermaid. You can make out the start of the name up top, Hans, and the few fragments of text that we can read talk about huge ice masses, flashing lightning, as well as something about the crew, and a line about her floating. All of this lines up relatively well with this translation I found by M.R. James, and so this may just be another given translation of that collection of stories. The creators of the show put a lot of time and effort into seeding easter eggs and details in the sets and props, however, there are a couple instances of our real world objects being used as props without much obfuscation, and I'll talk about another one later in this video. Thematically, The Little Mermaid works very well with the character of Kaya, who in the source material is a sickly girl who cannot leave her home, but longs to be able to overcome her physicality and exist in the world that she gazes so fondly upon. 
They're both daughters of high status, and there's also a similar resolution to each character's arc, with Kaya devoting her life to helping others by becoming a doctor, and the Little Mermaid ascending to the status of a spirit who must do good deeds for humankind. If this text is in fact from the Little Mermaid, then this is a really, really cool parallel. Now, could all this be a stretch? Maybe. Did I just spend the better part of two hours reading through various translations of the Little Mermaid and looking into various Little Mermaid lore? Yes. Let's move on. One of my favorite parts of Usopp's character is that he tells these grand over-the-top lies that in the source material often end up coming true in one way or another. Here he gifts Kaya a rock, passing it off as a pearl that he obtained from coming across a giant goldfish with poop so big that it was the size of an island. Now this story is taken directly from the source material and we do in fact encounter a giant goldfish with island-sized poop as well. In this episode, we get the blue tea and the blue soup that we will come to find out has actually been the reason for Kaya's illness. None of the characters really seem to bat an eye at how strange it is for tea and soup to be the color blue, but as I hinted in my episode 1 breakdown with the blue alcohol, blue does not seem to be an uncommon color for the various foods in this world. Over on the marine side, Kobe and Garp duke it out in a game of Go as Garp tests Kobe's strategic thinking and thematically, while this game operates with black and white pieces, Kobe will soon learn from Garp that being a marine is not as clear as black and white, but rather, there are gray areas as well and pushes Kobe to act decisively instead of over thinking. Also of note, his personalized go board here is really cool with the decorated dog's heads just like the ship. We have another straw hat outfit change, but this time it's for the dinner party. Luffy's outfit here with the black vest may be inspired by his appearance on the cover of issue 44 of Weekly Shonen Jump back in 2001, which was then again used on the cover of Data Book Red the following year. Usopp and Zoro's outfits look to be inspired by their appearances on the cover of Volume 6, while Nami's outfit looks to be a nod to her appearance in the cover of Chapter 32. Usopp boasts about his encounter with a dragon, and asks Luffy if he's ever eaten a dragon. Now this is a nod to two different bits from the source material. In the source material, Usopp and the Usopp pirates pretended that they were capturing a dragon when chasing a lizard, a lie that would eventually come true hundreds of chapters later during the Punk Hazard arc, when the crew encounters a dragon for the first time and end up slaying it as well as eating it. And in the background of this scene, you'll notice these huge pirate penguin statues. These are a reference to the cover of chapter 17. Zoro confronts Clahador about his familiarity. If only the crew opened up that wanted poster that they found in the chest they stole from Shellstown. And in the back of the scene, you can make out a house transponder snail. Zoro then asks if he's ever been to the funky bar on Mirror Ball Island. And as we've talked about in the prior breakdowns, Django, a member of the Black Cat Pirates, visited Mirror Ball Island in his cover story. Later on, the Marines find Luffy's attempt at a Jolly Roger that surfaced after the crew sank their previous ship. And I love that this gag of the flag is being used as an actual plot device for this episode. Really cool writing here. Garp then instructs Kobe to take action and remarks that Helmeppo's status as senior cadet is unwarranted. I guess this is good as time as any to talk about the fact that in the source material, there is no Marine rank titled cadet. The hierarchy of Marine ranks was first explicitly explained in Volume 8's SBS Corner, and it was further expounded upon later in Volume 98's SBS. Kobe and Helmeppo were both enlisted as chore boys in the source material. Murray checks his pocket watch, and this was the other instance of an unobfuscated prop that I hinted at earlier. You can actually read here that this was made in the USA. Clahador says he tends to be light on his feet, a nod to a stealth foot technique that we'll see soon, and in the back, you can make out these barrels reading Deus. This was the brand of wine consumed by Doflamingo during his flashback in the Dressrosa arc. We're also introduced to Arlong, captain of the Arlong Pirates, and of course, this is a big departure from the source material, where we wouldn't get to meet him until much later on during the East Blue Saga. However, I really like how this take on Arlong is written, as he seems to have already started his operation of conquering the East Blue like he wanted in the source material. Also, there's a lot of foreshadowing going on with Buggy in this episode that is easy to miss on first viewing, particularly with his bandana, and I won't get too much into it just for anyone who hasn't watched all the episodes yet and are watching these breakdowns one at a time. Nami steals a candlestick from Kaya's mansion, among other things, and Kaya eventually lets her take some of these items with her. This reminded me a lot of Victor Hugo's Les Miserables, where Jean Valjean spends the night at a priest's house and tries to rob him of his decorated candlesticks, only for the priest to eventually gift Valjean the stolen items as an act of kindness and redemption for the thief. There's a ton of really cool statues and artwork in general in this mansion, and the camera doesn't really stay on any particular one for too long. Now, I don't think this is an explicit reference, but I couldn't help myself and I had to point out how this one bust reminds me a lot of Whitebeard with that mustache. Back in the wine cellar, Zoro picks up a bottle reading Ithersburgerstein from the region of Mikyot. This is 
is actually the same wine referred to by Full Body at the Baratier in the source material. The description of it being sour and dry are even adapted here. You'll note though that the bottle includes a year. This episode has given us several dates in the form of months and days, but now we have a specific year at last, implying that this series takes place at the very earliest during the year 1542. In the source material itself, there are not really any indicators of a specific year that the story is taking place. There have been a few mentions of calendar years, such as during the Jaya arc when Nolan's logbook mentioned a calendar year in the Age of Cayenne, or during the Alabasta arc when Robin mentions a calendar year in the Age of Heaven. However, given the context of that scene, there is a non-zero chance that the details of her statement aren't true. Now, over the years, fans have done their best to try and recreate the timeline of all the historical events in the series, which in theory would allow them a specific year for the current story. But, in my opinion, all of these efforts are pure hypothesis at best. But this show is making a call on the date, so I just figured I should bring it up and talk about it. We also have Usopp's flashback adapted, and while it is fairly short in the source material, I am surprised that they left out the hardest hitting part of it, where Usopp proclaims that he won't stop dreaming because he's the son of a pirate. Though, I guess in this adaptation, Usopp didn't have as much of a long-running aspiration for being a pirate as he did in the source material. Though given that, this episode does have my favorite ending so far in the series, with the marines arriving and Kobe believing Usopp that the pirates are here. This was truly beautiful, and every time I watch it, it kind of brings a tear to my eye just thinking about the scene. This is a loose adaptation of Usopp's feeling of helplessness after discovering Kuro's plans in the source material. And if you haven't realized it by now, we have fully departed from the source material Syrup Village. And I've honestly thought this to be enjoyable at so far. It's a very fun reimagining of an arc that a lot of people don't look back too fondly upon, though I do wish they did preserve Usopp's character a bit more. But hey, what can you do? We get new maps as well added to the credit sequence, and we get a look at the Gecko Islands, where you can spot Usopp's Galaxy Slingshot to the left, as well as this hammer to the right. And of note, this is one of the maps that places Mirabal Island above the Gecko Islands, while the map to the Grand Line as used in the series places it far to its right. There's also another map with a closer look at Syrup Village with the poison blue tea in frame, and up here, maybe a nod to the North Beach that the Black Cat Pirates invaded from in the source material. We also get a closer look at Shellstown, with the 153rd Marine Base and the main tower, and it's adorned with standard issue Marine Cap, a cutlass, and what looks to be a flintlock pistol. And lastly, we get a close up of the Island of Rare Animals, though depicted in the water is a sea boar, a sea beast that we first saw during Hotchon's cover story. And that's about it for the Easter eggs and details that I wanted to talk about in this one. If there's anything you spotted or want to talk more about, let me know in the comments. I love reading to see what everyone finds. This episode was really interesting, right? There's a lot more here than I expected, and all those details from the maps to the couple potential literary references, just really cool stuff. If you've been enjoying these breakdowns, I would really appreciate it if you subscribed so you can help the channel grow, but also so you can get the next breakdown as soon as it comes out. I'm working on episode 4's breakdown right now, and I can't wait to get into the next few episodes. As always, Thank you for watching, stay safe, and I hope to see you in the next one.